and um, just so well, but let me let me convene the meeting and then I'll make a couple opening remarks. Um, I don't see Margaret yet, um, and I believe she is planning on joining us. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I'm Kathy Shane. This is the December 2nd meeting of the school building committee. Um, and before I go into the agenda of the meeting and welcome our guest panelists today, I need to go around the room and make sure people can hear and be heard. Um, we are conducting this meeting virtually and we are recording it. So a recording will be available later for people to view and we will be posting it. I'm going to just call out the names of people who are on the committee and ask them to let us know if they can uh, see and be heard. And maybe since we are being joined by Donesco, the design, our lead designer group, um, as I call out your name, you could um, tell them who you are. <laughs> I'm Kathy Shane. I am chair of the committee and I am also on the town council. Paul? Uh, Paul Bockelman, town manager. Sean? Uh, Sean Mangano, director of finance. Steve? I'm Steve Schreiber, uh, town councilor, vice chair of this committee. And I'm going off of town council in January. Can so... you hear me? Yes. Yes. Because I can't so, hear you. But, uh, hit, the, uh, hit, 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 hit the volume buttons on your, on your keyboard. Yes. She can't hear you. <laughs> so I only have a couple. Anyway, I was going to say I only have a couple oh. more meetings left. Uh, but I should say, hey Steve, is, you're also an architect, Steve. So you I'm left architect. Us. Yeah, yeah. More than just an architect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, just an architect. It's fine. Okay. Mike. Present. And. I, I think you all, well, you met Mike because he's superintendent of schools. Uh, Jonathan. Good morning. I'm Jonathan Salvin. I'm, I'm an architect here in town and a parent of a Fort River, or two Fort River students. Uh, Tamara. Hi, I can hear. Um, <clears throat> I am the interim principal at Fort River Elementary School. Ben. I'm Ben Harrington. I'm the school committee representative and the assistant director of facilities for Amherst Schools. And Rupert will be joining momentarily. Okay. And Allison. Hello, I'm Allison Estes. I'm the assistant principal at Wildwood Elementary. Okay, so seeing we have a re uh, quorum, I'm calling the meeting to order. Um, the main uh, item on today's agenda is meeting Donesco and they will, uh, and Margaret, I may just turn this over to you, um, both to introduce them, but we've figured out, we talked yesterday briefly about today's presentation right, and, and it will be, and anyone who, anybody who isn't talking, it would be good to mute your mic so we don't get a, a background noise. Um, I don't know where that's coming from, but they're going to discuss sort of timeline, some engagement uh, issues with us. And then I want to make sure anyone, a few, like Allison said, she has to leave early. We have scheduled, and I spoke with Allison McDonald, who is head of the school committee, on December 14th at 7 p.m. Donisco will be joining the school committee with a joint meeting for an hour with about a 20 minute presentation, but engaging the larger community, which will really be a launch of this. Um, so Margaret, I'm um, just going to turn it over. I see Rupert is here too. So Rupert, um, just make sure we can hear you and you can hear us and also introduce yourself, please. Okay. There, I, I got it unmuted. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, my, my, I'm Rupert Roy Clark. I'm the facilities director for the school system. Okay. Okay, Margaret, why don't you just lead in if you want to, sure. or we can just turn it over to Donna. <clears throat> so, yeah, I'm, I'm just going to sort of briefly remind everybody since I couldn't um, speak earlier. So I'm the owner's project manager, um, Margaret Wood with Answer Advisory. And yes, we've had since the interviews, which were I think on the 15th, 
we've had um, a number of conversations with Denisco, and this is today, as Kathy says, mostly to introduce them and to give them a chance to talk about what we've discussed. Um, I will kind of lead off by saying that <clears throat> one of the biggest issues to me as the person responsible for managing the schedule on the project was to figure out right away um, when was, it, if it was going to be possible to get to a November vote, November 2022 22 vote on this project. And as we discussed at the last meeting, um, and Jonathan, thank you for chiming in about that. It was, an, it was a really fast schedule. And I will say that to me, there were two scary parts about it. Uh, one was that we were moving awfully fast through the community engagement process. And the second was we were um, going to be asking a lot of the designers, we we're giving them a very short period of time for schematic design. So, you know, just to refresh everybody's memories, there's a programming submittal, there's a submittal of options. And then once the option has been, uh, the preferred option has been put forward, then the design team needs to really dig in and go as far with schematic design as they can for the purposes of establishing the cost of the funding agreement with the MSBA. It's not a good idea to shorten that. And I think Denisco has sort of further um, enforced um, what we began to talk about at the last meeting, which was that you know they really need more time than the November schedule would allow. They need more time for schematic design. And I think we feel as a group, we need more time for community engagement. So um, I am gonna stop talking and just say that one of the things that they're gonna present is their draft uh, milestone agenda for the project that also helps us understand where we're getting to, you know, when the project, the building would be delivered, which I think is probably the most important thing to keep an eye on. So Donna, why don't you and your team introduce yourselves and I'll shut up. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Donna Denisco, and I'll be working closely with Vivian, Rick and Tim. Um, you'll be seeing all of us um, probably at most, most or all meetings. I'll be working um, on the education program, community outreach, just the overview and process. And um, we look, really look forward to working with you all. Uh, Rick, or everyone just want to introduce themselves? Sure. Uh, Rick Rice, you'll be seeing me uh, all the way through. Uh, uh, especially when we get into the construction documents and deeper into more detailed design, because that starts to establish uh, scope and uh, schedule and through construction. I'm Vivian Lowe. I'm a principal at Denisco, and I will be the design lead on this project. So you'll see me primarily or mostly at the front end. Um, I'll be working also closely with the team on the community outreach um, and we'll be attending all the meetings and um, hopefully see this all the way through, but um, mostly at the front end. Um, Tim Cooper, I'll be the project manager for Denisco, uh, managing our consultants and our team and I'll be with you throughout from design through the very end. All right, so Donna, you want to talk a little bit about the schedule or would you like to start? Um, no, no, we, we can jump right in on that. Did you, can you pull that up or do you need to? I can pull it up if you give me just a second. I'm sure, having sure. some technical difficulties here this morning, but yes, give me just okay. a minute. So I think we would just like to add on to Margaret's comments. Um, the schematic design absolutely uh, um, maximizes your your reimbursement with the uh, MSBA, right? So that establishes not only what you need to fund and, and what we're gonna be going to request for an override, but it establishes MSBA's participation in the project. So we really, cost is really important, but the other really important component is once we submit a final space summary to MSBA on the size of the programs, uh, spaces, the location of them, that's it too. Um, DESI also plays a really important role in that. So 
we just feel between the two of them, we want to make sure that we maximize the square footage, that the spaces are exactly where they should go, and uh, we have a really solid foundation to moving forward. So with that, um, you know, as Margaret said, we're sort of tied to the MSBA board meetings at the very beginning, which dictate or inform when we, um, how much time we have. So again, you know, keeping the eye on the prize, so to speak, um, we're making sure that the occupancy is um, ready for um, September or the fall of 2026, which seems crazy, but it'll be here sooner than we know it. Um, we, we just started working backwards. Um, the designer typically does are the ones that get squeezed a little bit because construction's construction, and we know how much time that's going to take. Um, so we've I'm going to work backwards uh, just so you can see how we kind of fit ourselves into the schedule. Um, we've identified about 24 months for construction right now. We don't know what site, we don't know what the final solution is. Um, we probably are gonna have, if it's a new building, we we have to move the children into the new building and then tear down the existing building and site and finish up the site. So we have to fully vet that out, but we're saying 24 months, uh, we believe is right now an adequate time uh, for, for the duration of construction. And again, depending on what occurs um, with the final solution, there may be some additional site or, or building work on the other end. Um, we're assuming it's a CM um, procurement process. So we've identified only about five weeks for bidding. And then for construction documents, we've allocated 10 months. And um, we think between that and the design development, we can push and pull, we might start um, bidding a little bit earlier, but overall about a 12 to about a 12 to 14 month um, duration is what we feel is appropriate to make sure our documents are solid for bidding. And then so when you work backwards, um, you, know, you know, we end up, it is, would be a March vote for a um, override or obtain town funding, March, April. Um, and, and I guess that's a conversation um, with you all to make sure that, that is a viable time frame to be doing that. But for schematic design, six months is typically what we would really like to have to make sure that everything that is required is well documented. And our um, schedule indicates that we would be doing this for six months but what we would actually be doing is once we submit the uh, PSR, which would be our final um, decision and final solution, preferred solution, that we would actually start schematic design before the MSBA approves it. Uh, we will have a facility assessment subcommittee meeting before we submit the PSR to MSBA or right at the time we submit to MSBA. So we'll have an understanding if there are any issues with our solution, if they would like us to make some changes to it. So we'll have that time to start schematic design and incorporating the facility assessment subcommittees comments or recommendations. Um, so, Donna, so can I can I just add something because I yeah. haven't talked about the facility assessment subcommittee, oh, but okay. I, I think of it as um, a peer review group, which is uh, several um, board members as well as some other staff. So it's a moment that the MSBA sort of in a in a they give us comments in writing um, at the end of each phase, but this is a moment where there's actually a meeting. Um, I think it's on Zoom now. I haven't actually done one yeah. since the pandemic, but where the board members um, who are involved with programming and design and some other issues actually come together and make comments. Yeah, and and so it's, it's a really big deal for the design team because it can send us in a slightly different direction than the direction we were headed. Yeah. So um, we're happy to say that, that we actually look forward to these conversations. We understand what's important. Um, the DESI representative is also involved on those calls. So this is an opportunity for the board 
MSBA board to comment on our project and ask questions, not at the board meeting. So they just don't want to have this major debate and conversation at the board meeting when they actually move your project forward. So this is a informal way of making sure um, they fully understand the scope and the educational program. Um, but but that said, so then working backwards, um, you know, we really we have identified seven months for preferred schematics, so three months for PDP, and then four months, but we're going to be working um, in parallel from the preliminary design program while we're obtaining the information that we need for both sites, understanding, you know, doing community outreach, and we can talk about that for a little bit, but could we do it for a little bit less? Sure, but it doesn't matter. MSBA is dictating when we submit the PSR just because of their the way their boards are scheduled. So we are comfortable with the schedule. We know that we can have a new school, right? I say that in quotes, um, by September of 2026. And so I guess it's, you know, with the town, with understanding the reasons or rationale behind wanting to um, have a November vote, I hope that this is something that um, will work with the town as far as the funding and all of that, that that's required. So I want to add one other thing, Donna. Thank you. That was a great summary. So the, the piece of the project that is funded right now is through this line, obtain town funding, right? So the um, this is the piece that is sort of on the plate of the consultants right now. And once we're in schematic design, we'll be developing, as Donna said, you know, the, the well, it's the construction cost, but it's also the total, total project budget, inclusive of you know all the fees and costs and um, you know temporary temporary school space if we need it. All of that really gets developed in this phase. And um, as Donna said, you know you want to take the time to get the estimates correct. Um, and then there the submission. We don't know the dates for 2023, but we're guessing that there's a, a, a January or at the latest early February submittal, and then they typically vote about six weeks later. And so the um, town can do its local vote, well, it's supposed to do its local vote within 120 days of the MSBA vote. So you can do it sooner. Um, we are thinking that you probably wouldn't wanna do a vote in January or February, but that's up for discussion. Yeah, I see Mike has a question or comment and please and everybody else um, in the committee if both for clarification or other information and I, I might ask you Donna when does the educational plan need to be done within your timeline so let's say I'm going to call on Mike first and you need to unmute Mike sorry getting less uh, used to virtual meetings which is a good thing for my probably in general, but bad for this. Um, actually, I think your question is fine. I, mine can follow yours. So I think um, if, if you wanna have that one answered, Kathy, then I'll jump in after, cause it actually, that's a nice flow for where I'm going. Okay, so I will ask my question. So we need to do an educational plan um, and submit it along with these documents. So Donna, can you just talk about when that happens and your thoughts about how you would be working with Amherst with Mike and schools. Right, so the education program is part of the preliminary design program. And this is the foundation for your project. And it is so critically important that we identify all of your programs, how they function throughout the district, not just within Fort River or Wildwood. MSBA wants to see collectively how we've thought through all of these programs and the impact. And I understand that the fifth, the fifth, sixth grade is shifting up. So we'll certainly want to address that. But all, this is the fundamental foundation of your project. They will refer back to your educational program when they look at the building plans, the floor plans, the layouts, the size of the spaces that they, they do. There's several members, Matt Denninger, Mike, I don't know if you know him, 
um, being one, Terry Kwan being another, and they really put the emphasis on education. So I know there's been a lot they, of- They being, the, these are members of the MSBA. Oh, right, sorry. Um, <laughs> They're like my, you know, BFFs, right? I just know them all. No, I don't mean they're my best friends. But yes. um, anyway, so, you know, understanding the importance of this, I, I know Mike has done a lot of work on this. We actually have a call set up for Monday morning just to kind of touch base and see how much work we've done. I know that this has been an evolution from the Wildwood Project and then taking it forward. So we really, I think there's a lot of work that, good work that has probably been done. MSBA has made a couple of changes over the last couple of years, but, but we wanna make sure that that's all incorporated. Um, as far as when it gets submitted, the latest it can get submitted to MSBA is, I believe it's six weeks prior to submitting our preferred schematic report. We prefer to do it much further in advance of that because they weigh in and we will get DESE comments and we will get other comments. Um, so, so we believe that that's an important component to make sure that we give them enough time to evaluate and review it and ask their questions and then be able to incorporate the final uh, educational program with the preferred schematic report. So as far as community outreach, uh, the education program is really driven by the program needs for the town of Amherst. However, there are parts of it that talk about spatial relationships and adjacencies and what's important to the community and where do you want to see these spaces. And so we feel that you know, it's important for the community to embrace it. Um, you know, there, there's some administrative and requirements from um, Mike and his team, but there, there is an opportunity for the community to comment and, and provide input. So we, we gave it three months. I think that's what was on the original schedule. Um, we, we believe that that's, unfortunately it's December, right? So I feel like we've already lost a month, but but we believe that that would be um, a great target. If we need a little bit more time, that's fine, we have it. Um, it doesn't stop us from then going forward with PSR. We're, we're working in the background doing all of the other work. Yeah. So we kind of see it working in tandem. Mike, so. Yep, perfect. So thank you. Uh, and I look forward to that conversation, Donna, uh, on Monday. And I just wanna share my appreciation for setting up what seems like a reasonable timeline. I particularly like um, kind of the shaded green and the schematic design because, you know, while there are these sort of touch points where MSBA gets involved, like Terry will absolutely grill me on why we need a kiln in the art room at the elementary level. So everyone can, like, if you're watching these meetings, Terry and I will go back and forth multiple times about kilns. Our art teachers are passionate about uh, the importance of kilns at the elementary level. Terry is not. So we know that's going to happen. It's going to take time, right? Um, so I really appreciate you putting this together. I guess my only, uh, we don't know each other that well. And so I uh, have two dimensions to my comment. One is a level of uh, anxiousness um, that we've been at this a long time, right? And people in our community and, and representing the schools are hungry to be in uh, better learning environments. So I think 2026 totally makes sense. I'm not pushing at all on that. Uh, but I think once people hear that, like right now at a public meeting, uh, there will be some expectation that we, you know, achieve that. And some of my anxiety comes from sometimes things in Amherst occasionally take a little longer than they take other places, right? Um, and that's not a critique of Amherst. I think there's some real benefit to that. So I guess my question is, and it's sort of a dangerous one, but is there enough wiggle room where if we get delayed for some reason, like when we were hiring you all, we got delayed because of a technical snafu that just happened. Uh, it wasn't a huge delay. So, you know, I guess my question is, is that built in a little bit? So if, you know, we do have an to have an extra meeting and I'm not picking on Terry, she was great. She gave really good feedback. Just the kiln thing is, is a passion point for both of us in opposite directions. Um, you know, is that built in so that one minor delay doesn't mean that we're looking at 2027? Because I think both for me and my role, uh, being an advocate for kids, as well as, you know, I'm thinking of Tammy and Allison and the buildings they 
currently spend their days in uh, and children do. Um, I just want to make sure that we're, we have, and you all know this because you're all incredibly well versed at MSBA, but sometimes unexpected or unforeseen things happen. Um, so I guess I don't, I don't want to pretend that like you've built in six months and it's going to be easy, but um, have you thought through those pieces? And if you have, I think sharing them with the committee would be really helpful. Um, thanks, Mike. And and just so you know, we've got you back on the kiln. Um, we we do it. We do it in almost all of our elementary schools. So 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 we just want to clearly the, the, the identify that. Take this one on, with yeah. Terry. So 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 we just want to <laughs> clearly identify in your educational program the the reason behind the kiln. So we got you on that. Um, but but as far as the schedule, right? This is. This is a preliminary schedule and you're right, this is being recorded. We wanna make sure that this is our first pass and showing you how we can still reach your, uh, your September, 2026 um, opening date. There is wiggle room. There are different ways to look at this. We have 14 months built into design development and um, construction documents. So we have some time there. If this does go, a CM route, route, which I think it was before, um, but but that conversation has to come, come up again. But assuming it is a CM route, there are ways that we can accelerate the construction and start doing some of that while we're still in construction documents so that we can pick up some construction time if that occurs. Donna, if we, even if it doesn't go CM, we have done design bid build projects where we've done early site packages to get a shovel ready site for a big contractor. So there, there's even ways to early bid if the design scheme and the schedule uh, makes it important. So you have some flexibility at the front end. Yeah. For both delivery methods. Kathy, could I ask a quick follow-up? Would that be okay? Uh, I don't wanna hog the airtime. Um, but um, I think that's really helpful and I appreciate you sharing that, not just with me, but with the community and the public, because I think that's a question that's gonna be on people's minds. I think my follow-up to that is uh, just a request, I guess, when we do get into uh, new construction versus ad reno and all those pieces, I know my experience is not just from the Wildwood, but from all projects is they have different, um, even different sites may have different uh, estimates for construction. And I think that really has to be part of the conversation. Um, as we move forward about the impact to the sites. I'm gonna speak a little for Allison and Tammy, um, just that, you know, I think those are real considerations. I know that that for perhaps generous members of the general public, they may be less, but for the people working every day in the schools, understanding how long construction is gonna happen, the impact on the current students, because instructions construction is not gonna be a six month process, Allison and Tammy, I apologize, it's just not gonna be that quick. Um, so I just want to emphasize that, you know, kind of looking back and what I've learned in the prior project, probably didn't talk about that publicly enough, that there, there really is an impact. Uh, and I know you're looking at 50 years, but you're looking at, you know, basically a quarter of kids elementary experience, the kids at Wildwood or, or Fort River that's impacted by that. And um, just just want to tag that as something that I really want to be part of the public discussion moving forward. But that's yeah, it. I'll, I, I will promise I'll be quiet after this. Uh, um, no, right. that's okay. I, I, and that's a really important piece. And I think that's why another reason why we're saying that we need a little more time, both at PSR, because at the end of PSR, you have to make a decision what your preferred solution is. And we need to give everyone all the information that they need to make an informed decision, which includes renovation and addition and what the impacts are and how that might change the duration of construction. Um, and so we have no pro preconceived notions on what the best solution is, but we have multiple sites and multiple options that we have to consider. We're hoping that we don't have to revert back to just look at a 320 student school, but if we have to do that per MSBA's enrollment with you all, um, we just need all of that time to have all of the information so we can present to everyone. But I'm gonna say something a little different, Mike. So there is an impact, absolutely, whether it's a renovation addition or new construction on these sites. Like, and, and then depending on what we do for uh, sustainability and our net zero, there, there are all these impacts. 
the impact is for the um, administrators and, and the parents. The kids love it. So, <laughs> so, you know, it's so exciting. And then they're so excited to even come back and see, you know, what, what it was. So, so we, we do thank both um, principals here uh, for your patience and your input, because you're also going to have a really important role in talking through all of this. Um, I just want to add one other thing, which is you know, one of the things that I is really important to me here is having looked in detail at the Wild, Wildwood Project and then at the Fort River study um, is actually setting this up so that we're looking them at them on parallel ground. And I think it's really hard to do two separate projects and two separate time frames and feel like you've made a real comparison. This will be a real comparison. Um, starting with the establishment of priorities um, and not, you know, diving in right away. The, the first thing we are, we are, we are not going to immediately start presenting options. First, we are going to establish priorities and the priorities, the establishment of the priorities is going to be the basis of the evaluation. And I think that's really important because, you know, people see in options what they want to see, to be honest, to some extent, it becomes hard. And so now, right now, there are these two studies that were done in different settings with different partners. It becomes really, you don't, you can't compare them. So what we're, we're sort of starting, um, we have a lot of information to work with, but in terms of the comparison, we're starting on a level playing field, looking at the options. Um, Donna, yesterday um, I had, uh, it was a terrific conversation, a little bit about the way you and Tim weighed in on the way you work with uh, different groups. So parents and teachers, you know, to be getting input and listening. Do you want to say just a little bit, give a flavor of that? Um, because we've, um, and, and then we have to work with the school system to figure out how we do the various things. But I, I found it really useful to hear <clears throat> what your approach has been. <clears throat> sure, thank you. And I'll, Vivian and Tim, feel free to chime in. Um, so, you know, we, we actually are, I, I agree with you, Mike, we hate these Zoom calls, but, but we think that sometimes that actually brings more people to the table. So I think that if there's a way to incorporate both virtual and in-person at some point in time, I, that, that would be really great. But um, for us, it really is an inclusive um, community engagement and outreach. So the opportunities where the community has input and that they're comfortable in the right setting to ask questions and also provide varying perspectives. It's, it's just really important to us that not only the communication and the dialogue can't just be in one direction. And the goal really is to make a setting that's comfortable enough for people to ask the questions and voice their opinions without getting into debates or, or debates are good, arguments are not good, um, that people can walk away and at least respectfully disagree because there are so many mutually exclusive needs and, and opinions. Um, and, and we have to weigh all of those as we move forward with the, with the project. Um, we think community forums are a good way to reach out to a larger audience. And of course, with Zoom, that, that even makes it um, more accessible. We have found that instead of 50 people or 100 people in an auditorium, we have 300 people on a Zoom call, um, but we don't hear very much from them. We think a more personal, intimate setting will allow people to be more comfortable to voice their opinions. Um, so Tim, if you wanna talk about how we would recommend like a series of workshops or how, how we might roll this out as well. Sure, uh, as a little bit of background, I'm on the school building committee in my town. We just passed the vote for an elementary school. And prior to that, uh, we failed the vote. So it's very easy for me to put myself in your position and understand what you're doing. And in between those votes, um, 
there were a few task force and we spent a lot of time thinking about how we could engage, how we could listen to everybody, embrace the voices that were trying to improve the project. Um, some of the most effective meetings we had, and granted this was in person, uh, it was a forum where you had breakout sections by topic. So people would rotate between rooms um, and the topics for each room would vary. It would be sustainability, traffic, open space, educational program. Um, and then these smaller settings would allow people to, you know, interact in a more genuine conversational way with maybe a group of 10 rather than an auditorium, because often in an auditorium, a loud voice with a particular point of view can drive and direct the conversation. And so these smaller groups would allow you to one, hear more, and to take better notes and quantify so that that information could be uh, communicated back and you know used as the evaluation and the rubric basically to evaluate future decisions going forward. Um, we did this on person and in Zoom and just that sort of approach, which I'm sure you have all thought about in the way you're gonna do it is uh, something that we would like to work with you and you know, tweak as we move forward. I also wanted to just add that we feel it's so important to reach everyone um, at different levels, right? So we would recommend these larger community forums where we invite all of Amherst, whoever is interested, whoever has a stake in this, who, whoever uh, has an, an opinion so that they feel that they're being heard, but it's also, as important, if not more, that we fold in the school communities. So that would be um, smaller group meetings with the parents, the teachers, uh, the neighbors. We have had meetings um, with just the direct neighbors of each school so that they know that we, we see them and we hear them and their priorities are also folded into the overall priorities. Consensus is just such a, so important as you all know, um, having just completed the permitting and now in construction of a project that for a community that was exactly divided in half, it could have swung one way or the other by five or 10 votes. It, it was crazy. And, you know, we didn't, what I heard, what we heard from this is we didn't know about these meetings. Well, you know, we, advertise, we try to reach out. So it's it's incumbent on us all to make sure everyone is reached and that we reach them at all different levels. And, um, you know, for, for the Spanish, for the, the populations where English is not the first language, we'll send out flyers with the kids in the language that they can understand. Um, as Donna said, sometimes these Zoom meetings, they're great actually, because we could share information so much more clearly also, we put, as Donna, or as Margaret did, we, we put the slides right on the screen and they could see exactly what we're talking about and we can zoom in. Where sometimes if you're looking at draw or drawings or slides in an auditorium, it's a little more difficult, right? To just kind of pinpoint to exactly what we're trying to say. But, but that all said, we just want to assure you that our goal in this, this whole initial phase is in terms of um, establishing priorities is to hear what everyone's priorities are because when this is all said and done, we want folks to feel like this is, this is their school. This is not a school that we're imposing on anyone. And, and in that way, we'll build that consensus. And I think um, to add to that, throughout this entire process, as you probably have, um, worked your way through the first, the first project that I don't want to say compromises are going to need to be made, but there are mutually exclusive needs um, all, all throughout the, it could be from cost to the ideal educational program with, you know, a 12,000 square foot gym, right? So, so there, there are mutually exclusive needs that we're all going to have to come to making the best decisions. And that includes buy-in from the community. What makes the most sense? Um, if, if we can achieve lead platinum, but it's gonna cost you, 
you know, an extra $50 million, I'm just making up numbers, you know, we know that's not going to happen. So, so for us, it, it's really making sure that everyone um, understands the decisions and has an opportunity for input throughout the entire process. And we would love to say that we can do everything. You know, we never say no, um, but I don't know what, what community has ever been able to say we yes to everything. And so this is gonna be what's most important for you all. And we just wanna make sure that everyone agrees with, with the priorities and the decisions that are being made as we go along. Tamara, Tamara has, I see her hand is up too. Um, excuse me, two questions, and maybe I missed it, um, is one, who, who's creating the dates and the itinerary for these meetings? Is there a subgroup that I somehow missed? Is this incumbent upon us? And also, one of the things I'm thinking about as you're talking, and, and I really appreciate the idea of hearing everybody's voice, but I, based on my own experience and talking to families, I know often they don't necessarily or feel themselves represented? And are there explicit, I guess what I'm hoping for, and I'm sure that you can provide explicit instances in which families' voices were heard and then carried out. Because I think those are the things that families are gonna give all of us and all of you street cred, right? Like who, who are these predominantly bunch of white people telling me that I actually have voice and choice in this? I don't, I, I don't, I think we have to build a capacity for that as well. And I think by sharing more intimate stories would support that. Um, and then obviously the sooner we can get um, talking points and dates for community forums, the better, but thank you. So, so Tamara, I'll answer the, how do we engage or how do we listen or um, engage these uh, parents and families? We start listening to them, what's important to them, what's important to their school. It could be anything from safe walking routes, right? You're, you're gonna have a combined school. So we're gonna, we're really, there's so, so many different sets of perhaps excitement, concerns, and, and um, what might work best for them and their families. So, so we wanna start that conversation as soon as possible. The other thing is we don't just listen and say, thanks, have a nice day, and, and, and we never come back. Um, in many communities, this community, this family or P PGO or whatever, right, your, your local communities, we have these conversations all the way through the project. And we absolutely have to pick it up again, right, before construction, because now anxiety starts setting in, like, you know, how is my kid going to learn? What's the disruption, et cetera? So we will never have a meeting, get input, and not follow up with a meeting and say, this is what we think we heard. This is our approach. This is why or why not. We can't do it because it's important to hear them. But if it can't be done, which I hate to ever say, um, maybe just at home, right? <laughs> you get what you get and you don't get upset, so I say to my kid, but we hate to say at that, but there might be instances where something might just not be possible, whether it's cost or size or whatever. But we always wanna go back to people and say, we heard you, we think this is what you were saying or requesting, and this is how we've addressed it. And if we can't do it, this is how we, why we can't. Tamara was also asking the, the logistics uh, itinerary. How do we work with you to set these up? I guess is a, you know, um, you know, and and it looks like January is a really important month um, since we don't have. So, so I'm just gonna, you know, how do you how do you come and orchestrate these? So, Donna, let me um, speak briefly just sort of a link to prior conversations. So um, what's been discussed here is that there would be, and Tamara, I'm not sure whether you were in the meeting where this happened, but we've talked about creating um, a working group that would provide input to the design team um, around communications. And we haven't identified who those people were. I mean, there's definitely a couple of people in this group 
I would definitely want to have their regular input. And you and Allison are sort of at the top of that list. Um, and we haven't, Kathy, I don't know if you thought anything any more about the mechanics of how we would establish the subgroup. Because Not that I think that's the answer to Tamara's question is there's going to be a subgroup that's going to work with the design team to establish the schedule. And the one thing I've conveyed to them is that it's what I've heard is it's really important for people to see the arc of the process. That if we say there's a meeting and we'll get back to you when we're going to have the next meeting, people lose the thread. They don't understand where they are in the process. So um, and um, actually. Uh, someone in this group has been really sort of, um, uh, Phoebe isn't here today, I guess I'm looking for Phoebe's face, right? right? Phoebe's the one who I think has really nailed this issue for me. So, Kathy, any more thoughts about the mechanics of that? You're muted. Phoebe did say she couldn't come today, but this is her key issue. Phoebe Miriam, who's on our committee, she wants to be part of this and wants to help in any way, both as a person, but also links to the community and links to the school. So it's of she has raised her hand and her voice more than once on this issue. So she is a, a willing, able, and eager. So I think what's important as far as when, we would love to map out kind of, um, a series of meetings. But I think what we've also heard is what's important is we're not just coming back just to talk if we don't have more information or respond to your comments. And that's totally valid. Don't waste their time. We all probably have better things to do too, right? So let's make sure that we lay out enough time in between meetings so that depending on what the questions are or the requests are, that we have enough time to fully vet them. Um, traffic is going to take a little bit of time. So we, you know, we want to make sure that we get going on that so that we can maybe have a conversation about traffic sooner rather than later. That's just an example. Sustainability is another one. So um, we feel that we absolutely agree. Let's, let's maybe line them up, but we just want to make sure that depending on what the topic is, that we have enough time in between meetings to be able to thoughtfully respond to people. Um, Tamara, did you, did you have a follow up or is your hand still up? Okay. No, Anyone? I thought I lowered it. Sorry. That's, that's okay. I just didn't want to cut you off. Um, anyone else with questions or comments? I know, Jonathan, you, you had emphasized at earlier meetings this point of it's better to have a meeting when actions are being considered rather than we're just saying, here's a process that we're gonna go through um, and the importance of, we're, we're at the point of making a decision and here's the information we have. Um, we haven't made the decision yet, but, but we've gathered it. And I know on the site, site number one or site number two, trying to, um, we, we should have, um, a focused discussion at this committee level of the list of things that we want to be thinking about when we're saying Wildwood or Fort River and just have it so that the design team can be gathering information that would say, okay, this is what we know about traffic is what you've mentioned, but water levels, other kinds of, you know, how much space we have to work with. We've talked about wanting to have an outdoor for play, but all outdoor for learning, um, what kind of space we have outside the school building. So I think those, when we have some of that, you can get input more readily if people have something to bounce off of, you know, that we're not just working off of con building up the concepts. People can add to the list, but at least have something to work off of. All right, Cassie, I, I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> yes, yeah. I, I agree with what you were saying. You know, it, it, there is a, there, it, there needs to be kind of a combination of both presenting topics that you request input from. Um, and then as you get, as you kind of return and report back as it were, um, you know, where you, you're taking in of the information you have, it's nice often to have something to, 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 to view, to respond to, you know, for the individual that you're reading or the group that you're reaching out to. 
Um, but I'm very comfortable with what I've been hearing this morning that that, that process will, will happen. And I very much agree with what Margaret said earlier on about uh, sort of setting the priorities or the, um, the metric of, of data that we're gonna compare um, options against first so that we're all very clear about what it is that we're trying to achieve uh, in the new school design um, and then that have a common basis for um, looking at, neutrally looking at um, the options that we'll have to assess. Any other comments? Um, Rupert, I know you've always emphasized um, when we're talking about sustainability or the systems um, that we were aiming for a high performance building in terms of uh, uh, energy use, electric, but that we also need a building that can be run once the designers and engineers leave us. Um, and, and, and both ma maintenance costs, but uh, sophistication or ease of use. Um, so Rupert, I don't know whether you wanted to say a little bit about that, but you've been fairly eloquent about it at earlier meetings. Uh, I think this is something that's going to develop as we uh, as we proceed with the project. It's not necessarily going to um, come up in the first uh, month or two, but yes, absolutely. Um, uh, I've seen buildings that are very high performing for the first six months or nine months or year or two, uh, and then fall to pieces because they're just too difficult to maintain. And I'm sure that uh, Denisco has seen the same thing as well. Hey, I'm not, um, I'm, I'm just making sure that I'm looking around the room on any other questions or comments. And I will make sure that we take that diagram that we just saw today on the screen and we make it part of this meeting's packet so people won't have that one glimpse of it. We'll, we'll save it as a PDF. And there's um, a beginning grid that Margaret's been working on and she shared with Denisco the other day on um, a list of issues about uh, to think about when we're comparing sites. Um, and I think that would be a good document to be able to share with the committee, Margaret, and I would just send it out as an attachment. Um, so we, we, haven't, we have a next meeting, joint meeting on the 14th with the school committee. Um, and what Allison McDonald, who's chair of that has requested is in that hour, about a 20 minute presentation uh, discussion from Donesco on here's your team, you know, our approach. And that would be, um, we're, we're talking about that as sort of the, the, a big public launch. Um, and so I'm segueing into Margaret giving us an update about the, the website and the launch of the website so that we, we are telling the community that we are really starting on this. And then, um, so I'm turning it to you, Margaret, but I also wanted to get a sense of meeting schedules and, and may do this with a poll with people rather than try to take time that when we turn to D January, the frequency of meetings, trying to set, make sure we have times that people can come to the meeting. And I see Paul's got his hand up. So, Paul, are you about yeah, to... Just just yep. for the for the meeting on the 14th if i were on the school committee i would be looking to understand some and we talked about this a little bit but um just the key dates and our expectations not by i mean by month i think so when does we it's already on there but to be very explicit and clear because i think what's the what's the overriding message uh, the the educated plan has to be finished by this date um we we expect the uh, an override vote in you know first quarter of 2023 or whatever it is uh we expect construction to start on that date uh, you know the just sort of give a time frame for people of the big that that chart that we have is great but i think for the general public it's going to be really important to have the five key milestone dates that we so people can start to wrap their head around it and it becomes more real and it becomes very simple to understand for most people that's why I would suggest we do that. Thank you. So, so um, Kathy, just to respond to your question. So the website is ready to go and I have 
kind of been sitting on it because um, I wanted to roll it out once we had had this meeting, because I think what's great about this meeting is that it's an introduction to all of you, but it will also be an introduction of Danisco to the community. So um, you, my next step um, is to coordinate with uh, Brianna and the folks at the district about, um, it's easy for us to make it go live, but we sort of want to make it go live with a splash. And Kathy, I feel like we did a press, we drafted a press release no, around- we, 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 we did a press release. The press release is done. Okay. So um, basically I need about a day just to sort of have a plan with Brianna and um, uh, the folks at the district to kind of make it go live with a splash. And then one of the things is going to say is, you know, come and listen to, you know, the first uh, billing committee's first meeting with the designer so that they get to have the same sense of like, now we're cooking that hopefully you are all getting today. And, it, and I, we, we record the meeting. So today's meeting, one of the things we will have is a link to this meeting. So this initial conversation will be part of it. Um, and yeah. um, if one of the things I had hoped to get, but we can figure out whether this works for Danisco, you did a presentation to MSBA, and I think Margaret actually did a recording. If we had, if we had, it, it, well, if there was just a link, it wouldn't be part of the presentation, so people could see because yeah. in that in that presentation, you identified a lot of the other key consultant groups and people who would be work working with your team. Um, and that would say there is this larger group, and then here are the people you're really going to be seeing. So just some way of giving, um, without putting a lot of work, giving you a lot of work, it's things you've already put together, um, figuring out how we make that part of the information that people can easily get access to. Um, and you don't need to answer now how we do that, but I was just thinking you've already put a lot of work into that, so there's no reason not to have it be an introduction in addition to today. Kathy, just uh, sure, um, whatever you feel is the appropriate level of information. Are you referring to our interview? Is that what yeah. you're suggesting? Okay. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, that would be fine if you feel that that's appropriate. It's 30 minutes. That's a, lot, a long time, but, but sure. If, if you feel that um, it covers well, a lot, that's fine. Yeah. And you, you had a, you had a pack of slides and I realized it works better with the talking voices. So this would just be, people could click on it if they wanted to is my, my thought. And, yep. and we, we have the document when you apply, that is already up. It may be that people have to search for it, but we, we can figure out how to just make background documents so people can learn more to the extent they're interested. Um, yeah, that's absolutely fine. Whatever you feel is best, you have a permission to use it, sure. Well, and actually one of the key documents, I think, Kathy, this is getting at your piece because everybody can see this. So this is a page from um, Danisco's application that shows the size of the team and the number of people who are involved. And I think we will probably highlight this um, on the website so that people can understand there's this you know, pretty substantial team that are supporting the Danisco's architects. So any other, Kathy, yeah. um, Donna, you know, one thing I, I did look, thank you for <laughs> trying to figure out how to make the um, embed your, the, the thing about the, you know, we had, <laughs> for OPMs, right, we had slides, they had um, videos and <laughs> things that don't actually work very well. So I, I do agree with um, Kathy, that I think that the recording of the interview is more successful because we get to hear you all explaining, um, you know, what it is people are looking at on the screen. So I think that's a better, people will, I think people will find the, just the, the PowerPoint that you made, but thank you for making it, I think less successful. Yeah, and, I agree. Agreed. And, and don't forget that, you know, we had several members of the community come and listen to all the interviews. So if someone's interested, they will go there. So. so I'm 
I'm looking around the room and I don't see um, any other comments. So I wanna, if there aren't any, um, I will send out by email um, potential meeting dates in January. I see Jonathan's hand just went up. So I'll stop talking. You talk, Jonathan. Okay. It's just it just quickly to return to, to something I think that, that Tamara touched on. I, I'm not looking for this today, but curious when, at which of our next upcoming meetings we'll kind of have a sense of when that that schedule of public outreach will be kind of presented in a tentative way so that we're thinking ahead to that. I I, th I think Jonathan, that should be the next thing. So we, we'll just figure out the um, in January, if we can still, if this eight o'clock in the morning on Thursdays works, um, we can tentatively say that first week in January, we will get a here's some here's a suggested way of working coming out to Amherst and I know one of the issues Mike is going to be um, if we want small groups can there be small group in person meetings in the schools at all you know I mean you know what is what is our with mass with proof of immunization with what with whatever uh, pieces we want to do um, and then some of this higher level of uh, a graphic that says, you know, here's at least some things we want to think about, about sites. So if there's a talk with the community, you have something to bounce off. So I think aiming for, if, if, if I see, I'm looking around the room, but I also, Paul, if this poll, if eight o'clock in the morning on Thursdays works, we'll aim for that very first week, having some concrete scheduling and we'll, Margaret will just work with Donesco on, what their suggested way of doing it. And we work with Mike to say what's feasible on our end, um, particularly with teachers, with schools. Um, and Mike, um, you have a comment on that too? Yeah, the short story on the in-person stuff is things get a lot easier if, if the meetings are occurring well after the school day. Um, our current policy is that no visitors during the school day, except there's a couple of exemptions. This would not fall under one of the exemptions. Um, but if we are talking about um, after the students have gone, then we were able to get more flexible. Granted, things aren't looking wonderfully in the state right now, and, and we may have to backtrack on that. Hopefully we don't. Um, but, uh, you know, we have had the capacity to do things uh, when students aren't present that we just aren't willing to do during the typical school day. So um, that generally works well because that's when you'd want to have meetings, not when there's the buildings are full, it's hard to find space and, and all that. So, you know, that's something assuming that, you know, we kind of write our track right now in terms of COVID in Massachusetts, that we would be able to, uh, to think of ways to do that safely. I mean, um, for forums, they're almost too big, but our regional middle school and high school auditoriums have good ventilation. They're very large spaces, so people can be very distanced. And that's generally what we've been using for even for meetings that pre-COVID, we wouldn't think to have in the auditorium just because we don't have that many people coming to them, but it, it just ticks all the boxes. Um, they're both very easy to access, especially the middle school one. You go in the side entrance and it's right in front of you. So you're not tracking through the whole school, which just you know makes sense. So in terms of being in Fort River and Wildwood, that's perhaps a bit more complex. Uh, there's, not, there's not necessarily the great setup for this kind of thing. We could use the gyms, which have their own entrance, but it's not a hospitable environment, right? That's why we're all here. Um, so, um, you know, but I think I think we can think about doing some in-person ones with some protocols in place uh, in spaces that'll work and, and, and to Donna and, and others on the team that they work really well for presentation. Middle school in particular is, without getting into the weeds of it, it's a wide auditorium. So it works really well because you could have a lot of people and everyone feels close. The high school is very narrow and long. So while it's larger, it's actually just feels like it's, you know, people feel very far away from the presentation. And I know based on what I've seen of your style, you'd like to be interactive and it's hard to be interactive when people are uh, a great distance away. So that's something we could certainly, again, you know, given the numbers, we all have to track that we could do just, uh, just not really during the, the course of the actual school day. Okay. Um, so, so we'll also get, um, make sure Denisco knows when the school day ends, you know, when those are, and then just work. So Jonathan, I think we can, we can aim on it's January 6th is the, that first Thursday. We'll aim on having a schedule then, not just talking about it. Um, yeah, Mike. 
So January 6th is, is a holiday that's celebrated in the schools. So that's three Kings Day. So um, oh, that doesn't work. If, okay. if we could do a different day that um, that day, it's it's a day off and we've made it uh, a true day off. So OK, so then I, I, I'll I need to. Well, you know, I'm free every morning, but um, whether the, the fifth, you know, whether the fifth works. So we, if we need to shift the, the meeting time or date for our committee, we should just discuss that. But does I'm just going to look around. Does would the fifth work then? Yes. OK, so we'll say January 5th then at 8 a.m. meeting. And I see Sean's hand is up and I think I know. Well, I'll Sean. <laughs> I don't think you know what I'm going to say at all, Ken. <laughs> okay. Uh, we do. We do have. Um, if you're thinking invoices, we do have an invoice at some point. But um, I did have a question. Uh, one other working group or subcommittee we talked about having was a sustainability group, and I'm interested in Margaret or Donna's um, opinion on when when would be a good time for that group to convene or or be formed. Now, okay. <laughs> now would be great. Okay. And, and, and yeah, um, I I. Um, there are some other ones too, Sean. So thank you. I think I think we, you know, your community best. You know what, um, maybe maybe even as an outcome of the last meeting, right, where people's interests lie. But we can see sustainability being one subgroup, and traffic could be another. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. Another one which we haven't necessarily talked about and was a big issue on another consolidation project was the disposition of the school that isn't going to be used. Um, they felt that that conversation occurred way too late in the process that it should be thought through as, as we go through. Um, so there may be others, but we are ready. We've already started a conversation about geothermal with our team. So we love to engage you before we start going down a rabbit hole. So, so Kathy or, or Margaret, um, should we make that an agenda item at the next meeting? And I guess, how do we go about nominating people to, because I think there's going to be people maybe on this committee that want to be on that subgroup, but then there's going to be sort of our local experts or um, mm -hmm. we, have, we have a sustainability coordinator, for example, who might want to be involved. Um, how do we go about sort of nominating people or, or recommending people for that committee? Um, I, I think that's a, it's a good suggestion maybe for people to come with names, you know, and for example, um, uh, when talking with someone who's going to be newly on the council, she mentioned that the head of our conservation committee is a hydrologist um, and so knows a lot about, you know, where water tables, geothermal, and Jonathan probably has a list. So I think what we're talking about is people who no net zero who have either been building along this line and a, a very small group. So I think we, Sean, maybe if people send some names in by email to me, um, if they're not names that I already would have, and we will ask the ECAC group as well, because well, we have a active climate action committee with people with these kinds of expertise on it. And we're talking about a pretty small group, um, but that would be seen in Amherst as um, proponents and knowledgeable about this range of issues and real supporters of this being a model, not just a model school, but a model building for the whole town. I mean, this, there's a lot of pride in the fact that we put this bylaw on the books um, and we're aiming for, for this. Um, Paul, I see your hands up. Thank you. So yeah, I think before we start naming names, we should sort of clarify what are the committees, the subcommittees groups that we want and what we want them to do. You know, do we want members of the committee and out other members to be members? You know, because we mentioned a sustainability working group, an outreach group, a traffic group, a disposition of school group. I think we should start to first say, what are the support structures this committee needs or the building committee needs to, con to continue our work to inform the decisions that this group is going to have to make because this is a really important group in terms of decision-making. Right. So I think we want to sort of say, are we looking at three people on a sustainability group or, or 10 or seven? What is that number? What do we want them to do? Is it is it advisory group? You know, let's let's sort of like frame out what we want them to do before we start throwing names around because it might 
make a difference if you have a hydrologist on one versus a building expert on one. So we just want, I think let's, the next meeting should be like, what is our support structure for our committee here? I think that's a really good thing to bring up though. Okay, so so we will, that um, of course is wise. It's coming from Paul who's worked on these a lot. So we'll, we'll come up with boxes and talk about this in much a much more concrete way, way. But I think it is all just in your minds, be thinking about who do we know who's active. So if we say are three enough, um, not necessarily right away going to the names. But um, just just to add, it's just I think we want to say what are the and this would you yeah. know Donna Donna and uh, Margaret will help us with this. What are the typical support structures? Like the information about the disposition of the school was really instructive because I thought, oh, that's after the fact, but that's going to be key to what pe how people think about things yeah. in the course of choosing a location. Um, so I think that that's, um, you know, what are the different groups that we think we're going to need? And they may not all get formed at the same at right away, but just so we know we can present as being well organized. Well, and I think it's also important to send the message that these things aren't being discussed, you know, behind cl closed doors, that there's an opportunity for input with other people. The one thing that I will say is that I think any subgroup has to have a building committee member on it. So that it's, there's also, a, you know, a, just a capacity issue for all of you. Mm -hmm. um, there's probably some people here who would like to be on several, like Jonathan, I think of you like, you know, Community, you've had great comments about community engagement. I think you're interested in the sustainability piece, but th there is a capacity piece. And I, I, to me, it feels like the building committee folks should be with the design team and myself engaging the subgroup and then bringing that back here. So that that's the piece of structure, Paul, that I care about. Yeah, and just to jump on that too, um, we need to be aware that when we create these, if this committee creates the groups, then those groups are public bodies. They have to post their meetings. They have to keep minutes, all those things. So there is that sort of other p administrative piece that goes along with creating a new group. Yes, Mike. So just a clarifying question on Paul's point, uh, not to disagree, just to better understand. I know, would those be subcommittees or would they be working groups? Um, cause I think there, there's potentially a distinction and I'm not, I'm not pushing one or the other. I just want to raise the question cause I'll get asked it. Well, I want to strongly lobby for working groups, not subcommittees. The, there is no sub, I don't believe there's a sub fun, a functional difference between the two terms where there's a, where they call it's a committee. If it's a body created by a bo public body, that body is subject to the open meeting law. I, I still think it would be better to call them. A sub, Whatever sub you want to call it. Yeah. A working group. Okay. So I, Sean did remind me, that's what I thought I was, you were going to do, do is that we have to approve an invoice. Is that correct? And that we need to do that before I open it up for public comments. And I'm just, are we ready to move to that much more housekeeping? Yes. Do you want me to go ahead and share the invoice on sure. the screen? Sure. So this is the invoice for October, and Margaret, um, I assume Ramona is the uh, your assistant project manager. She is, yeah. Okay. Um, so that's the only sort of new element to this invoice, but it makes sense, and the rates and, are consistent with the um, with the contract. Yeah, and I will say what Ramona did here was she was making the um, reference calls and creating the documents that we're required by the MSBA to create to summarize reference checks. So do I hear a motion to, I'll make a motion. I make a motion to approve the invoice. Is there a second? Jonathan seconds. Okay. Um, I, I have to do roll call vote. So I need, Sean, you have to take it down from the screen so I can see who we have. Um, and so just approve or disapprove, Paul? Yes, approve. Sean? Approve. Mike? Approve. Jonathan? Approve. Rupert? Yes, approve. Ben? Approve. 
Tamara? Approve. Steve? Approve. And Kathy's approve, that's unanimous. So thank you, thank you everyone. I'm going to open it up for public comments, which will be, um, and I'm just looking at the attendees to see if anyone who has a hand up. And I'm not seeing any hands up. Oh, wait a second. Apparently not today. Um, thank you very much, Denisco team, for joining us. And I, I personally can't tell you how excited I am <laughs> to have the project start and to have a, a leadership team coming in um, talking about wanting to come out and talk to Amherst um, and, you know, uh, both listen, but move us along. I think there is, as Mike said, there is an anxiety of we all want this school, um, but we, we want a school that we will love for years to come and that works really well for the kids um, and that achieves the various high performance goals we've set for the building itself. And I, I saw in one of yours, but I think the building itself, the engagement of the kids both when it's going up, but once it opens, we think this will be one of their project-based learnings, that this was will be a climate, a climate action thing we've taken as a town. And we should be thinking about that all the way because that's one of the things I think that will engage families and why this is such an exciting project. So thank you very much. And I look forward to see you, seeing you again on the 14th. And um, maybe in between, we can get some feedback through Margaret on the various kinds of working groups we've talked about. So you can give us some input on what structure you think might work well, as Paul suggested. So, And then we can talk about times and meetings in January. So when we come together on the 5th of January at eight in the morning, um, we have concrete suggestions that the committee will look at. And so we can move quickly to getting to a plan, an action okay. plan. That sounds great. And you know, we'll probably maybe have some background conversations with locations and what might work or whatever. But um, so you will be hearing from us frequently. We, we communicate frequently, which is important to us. Well, thank you all very much um, and welcome. Welcome to the Amherst community. <laughs> thank you so much.